All right. We're going to discuss the devil this morning. As I'm sure you understand, in this class, the devil is defined as anything that is wrong with me, anything that is wrong with you. The devil is darkness, it's delusion, it's unconscious negative mechanical behavior. The devil is living outside of our real nature. It is anything that has power to carry us away because we're asleep. It is anything that burns us, that harms us. The devil is anything that makes us afraid of anything at all. The devil is a false power which has hoaxed us up to this point in our lives which we have believed in because we believe in ourselves wrongly. The devil, in short, is me, the devil is you. The devil in another human being or in mass organized society has no power at all over you unless you are a part of the devil of mass society. And this you have the devil in you. And this you have this darkness in you. And this you're on the same level as society. If society can bother you in any way at all, they can take advantage of you, if they can hurt you, if they can scare you, then you're being frightened by your own false identity, even in calling yourself the devil. If you call yourself a devil, you're boasting because you're not the devil at all. You've identified with that dark state and it gives you a certain pleasure and it gives you a certain, if you can imagine such an incredible thing that we get a pseudo security out of thinking how bad we are. A pseudo security out of thinking of how evil we are and loving that evil because it's all we know. <coughs> sort of review briefly, the devil is anything that is wrong with you, anything that is wrong with me. Your only concern, your only concern should be with what is wrong with you, the devil inside of you and with no one else, because you'll never be able to handle the devil and anyone else until you first handled it in yourself by dissolving it, by seeing through it, by understanding it thoroughly, by not fearing what is inside of you, which you now do. You're very much afraid of yourself, are you not? I know you are. You know you are. You know those habits, for example? Those, those mad, uh, ferocious thoughts, those, those hideous emotions that you have? You fear that, which is part of the bluff, which is why the devil has you, why he continues to distort your life. Because he's distorted everything inside of you, he can distort your outer life as well. Now I'm going to tell you, listen very carefully to this. I'm going to tell you the one thing that the devil can't stand. The one thing the devil can't stand. This is, this is the secret by which you can expose him and get him out of your life. Get him out of your mind. And not be a slave to him anymore. The one thing the devil can't stand, and I'll say this in several ways, the one thing the devil can't stand is for you to work on yourself while he has you in his grip. The one thing darkness can't stand is calmly and quietly work on yourself while you're being whirled around, while you're feeling guilty over those sex thoughts you have, while you feel depressed over what happened to you while you're, you're, you're hostile because you don't know what the future is going to bring you. I want to use the word sin deliberately. You understand? Because you have certain emotional attachments to it, and some of them are right. If you can work right in the middle of sinning, of being bad, of being evil, this is the one thing the devil can't stand because for the first time you're standing outside of his false power over you 
and beginning to understand, beginning to understand what is going on inside of you. This means awareness of what the devil is all about, of what the whole movement consists of, and understanding of that will begin to put an end to it. And this is the one thing the devil, which is not really a, in one sense he's a personality, because he, he can express himself in human personality. Have you ever known people that you swore were the devil really were? All right, that's what the devil is, expressing himself in human personality. Mm -hmm. But even those people, if they could wake up, which they won't probably, it's simply because they have been taken over by these negative forces. As you begin to work right in the middle of these terrible, awful things that go on inside of you, no matter what they are, as you self-interrupt, as you shed a bit of light on yourself right in the middle of these terrible things that you are doing, past, present, or even future things you think you might do evil, you will put an interruption in there, in there which will allow you to stand outside of yourself and thereby begin to understand what is happening inside of you which is the beginning of the end of the power of the devil, quote marks, of course, over you. Let me say that just as many ways as I can. Right in the middle of your nervousness, while standing up and giving a talk on Sunday, which is part of the devil, isn't it? It can't, certainly can't be part of the light. Can the light be nervous? It's poised, is it now? Right in the middle of giving your talk on Sunday, or out in a social situation during the week, you can stand apart from yourself and simply see what is happening in you and the, and the the worst it is that happens to you the more value you'll get if you do indeed stand outside simply to observe to see to make an effort to understand and refuse to go down underneath this tremendous emotional force that is trying to take you over this is right fighting this is right fighting, which means many things. It means, one, that you're getting your conditioned self, your old nature, your devil nature, out of the way. You're submitting. You're submitting to truth itself in order to be able to stand outside with something that is not part of the devil. Which will produce a great shock, a great disturbance in you. A, a greater conflict than you had before because this is shattering shattering time this is shattering the artificial self that only lives in time which we are loath to leave because the great fear of what will happen to me if I am no longer part of this devilish system I want to be part of that because it gives me this pseudo security I love to cry I love to scream Incredibly, you watch tomorrow when you give your talks. Incredibly, there is a certain false love for being nervous standing up here talking in front of the class. Can you imagine such a thing as having a certain security from being nervous, not just in the class, but meeting a crisis out in life, a crisis in your home? We have the false value of wanting to be nervous because this is all we know. Why not drop it right now? By the way, as an exercise, do it right now. Go back to your original relaxation that we had <coughs> at the beginning and start all over. <coughs> Now then, you should understand what it means to cooperate wrongly, unconsciously with the dark forces that are actually inside of us, which, which actually are there. Cooperation we, means to wish to go to sleep and to let them carry us along, to refuse to interrupt the state by what little bit of consciousness we can throw in, into it. See, interrupting it, as we've often said, throwing the log or the toothpick or the pencil or the baseball bat in front of the rushing truck to cause a bigger explosion. 
back to the original thought, the one thing the devil can't stand is for you to refuse to feel ashamed of yourself when you are doing something wrong or have done something wrong, to refuse to go down underneath it, to refuse to blame anyone else, see, refuse to blame anyone else, and even even to refuse to blame yourself for being in the state that you are now in. Because even blaming yourself is part of the darkness because it keeps you in place. You are the darkness. I am the darkness. If I hate myself, I have recreated the me and will continue the hatred going because I'd rather be a hateful person than to be no one. Our aim here is to put an end to the devil, which is me, which is you, and to be no one at all, which is to be everything, which is to have a blank space there, which is not an empty space, which is a different space, which is a space that doesn't even have to think about getting rid of the devil. We're starting on a very elementary level here, thinking correctly, trying to understand as best we can on the level of thought, understanding what to do, so that we're so free of the devil, we don't even have to think about it anymore. When you go out of here, in order to get full value from the meeting this morning, do write that down. You can write it down now if you want, or any time you like. Write down the following. Well, we'll go ahead and do it. And those of you listening to this tape can write it down too if you like. The one thing the devil can't stand is for me to work on myself right in the middle of all my sins. The one thing the devil can't stand is for me to work on myself right in the middle in the middle of all my sins. You know the trouble with that is I'll give you a minute to write. trouble with working on ourselves is that we don't remember to do so. Let me ask you a question. How many of you here in this room, and those of you listening to this tape, have been in any kind of a negative state within the last 24 hours? Let me see your hands, please. Any kind of a negative state. All right. Now, let me uh, go further with that. I want you to think very specifically, maybe even this morning, maybe right in this room, I want you to think of a very, don't evade by being general about it. I want you to think of a very specific negative state you were in either yesterday or tomorrow or today. Can you think of a, a state, specific one? Think of a specific, Joan, you should be able to. Think of a specific one. All right. Now, at the time that happened, at the time that happened, did you catch it or did you go into writing something on a piece of paper or getting coffee or talking with someone or whatever else you did? Instead of seeing it happening, happening at the moment it happened, which is it? Part of our work in working against the darkness is to catch the thing at the minute it happens. Otherwise, you'll never believe. You'll never see how completely under the domination you are of the devil. If you don't see it, then you'll then you'll you'll disagree right here as long as you have attended these classes, you'll disagree that you're that negative because you still have your images of being fairly well along the path. You had better pray for the day when you see that you are 20 times worse off than you think you are. That When you see that, then you don't congratulate yourself. That could go into vanity. <laughs> But that would be very healthy to see that you're far worse off than you imagine. This would be the beginning of the understanding of the devil himself, that one of his greatest, finest cunning tricks is to deceive us by thinking, by giving us, allowing us to have a mental image that we're working hard on ourselves. None of you in this room are working hard on yourselves. I'll guarantee you that. You may be beginning, but you're not working hard. You're not giving yourself the necessary jolts to see how much you're taken over. You can only drop 
a mechanical negative unconscious force, which is the devil, if you see it first. Otherwise, you'll never believe that it's taken you over. A resentment, a petty, a very small one. You'll never see, and as you start watching yourself minute by minute, You'll never see something that is incredibly important for you to see, which is to see how scared you really are. How scared you really are. And if you're scared, anything can knock you off that, that pedestal that you've set yourself up on in your imagination. Anything can knock you off of that. Let me ask you a question. You listen. Why does anything whatever disturb you? Why does anything whatever that happens to you in this room, in your home, at your business, in your personal private life, why does anything at all disturb you, upset you? make you nervous, make you scared. Why? It's because you have indeed not gone into yourself to understand what the devil is all about. Maybe you're thinking too much about working on yourself, about talking about truth and talking about it instead of doing the hard thing, the hard thing of watching yourself moment by moment, which is what we talked about all last night. I will ask you, let's just see what happens. How many of you who were given the exercise of walking out of the door consciously, how many of you actually did it? How many of you failed to do it? How many of you forgot to do it? All right. I assign the same thing again when you go out, and this will be the last I'll say of it, so there'll be a longer time lapse. Now let's see if you remember to do it when you go out the door today to walk consciously to your car or consciously to your home. Reduce your rate of walking one-third. As you go through your day, or as you're sitting here today, can you try to see a very vague, vague discomfort in you, which you can't even put your finger on, which you can't identify? Try to see a very vague, unidentifiable discomfort, uncertainty, doubt, self-doubt, nervousness. Try to see that, and then ask yourself why that has taken you over. Go deeper than that, and you'll see you simply do not understand why you've been taken over. But that's the first step in trying to understand it. Second question, why should you, why should you ever be hostile toward anyone or anything? Why? Why should you ever cry about anything? Why should you ever cry about anything, inwardly or outwardly? Don't you ever, 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 ever again cry about anything? No. Don't you justify it. Don't you call it tears of joy either. Okay, we'll have open discussion for a while, then we'll have the break. 
if there is open discussion. If not, we'll just sit here quietly for a little bit. Relax again, please. Change your physical position. One, two. You spoke quite some while back, Bernie, on words to this effect. We may be surprised someday to see that a part of us was right after all. Last night you spoke similarly that a certain part, I'll speak now, of my nature is right. Okay, now, I sense this, but I don't know what part to trust. I don't know what part of me to trust is natural. I want that natural part to express itself. I don't know what is. I'm getting more confused every day. Yes. Rightly, I don't know. Yes. Very good. Get more confused. I urge you to get more confused. That's all on that. Go ahead, Zee. Well, regard to uh, tears, crying, like we have been raised with the idea that it's okay to cry because it releases the tension mm -hmm. and so when we when we feel this is that when the, uh, uh, an image is going to crack like uh, tears go uh, image and tears go together they go together all right if you go ahead and cry which you will either inwardly or outwardly, I want you to point the arrow inside of yourself and watch yourself cry. Now that shouldn't be difficult. You should be able to, at the same time you're crying, bawling about something, knowing you're attracting attention, even if it's your own dreamland attention, you just watch yourself bawl. Just look at it. And look, look at how many wrong things you can see about it. Wastage of energy, vanity, self-reference. Now, as far as releasing energy, of course it does relieve it, but why should you have the tension in the first place in order to release? We're here to get rid of the tension so we don't have to get rid of it in tears or in any other way. To not have any tension, which is conflict, in any way at all. Then there's no need to cry, is there? But remember, crying is simply one way of it, of of releasing this tension that we have. How about anger? Yeah. You know you know that we have said many times in this class, boy, this is going to, listen to this, uh, those of you listening to this tape, when you cry, you are hostile. You are loaded with hatred when you cry. Now, how does that knock out that nice image you have of, of weeping because you're suffering for the world or whatever your particular neurotic description is? You're loaded with hatred when you cry. You are just turning it inwardly instead of outwardly. The devil has got you when you cry, when you bawl, when you let the tears flow. He laughs when you cry. Don't come around and me around me and cry. I don't want to be around you when you cry. You're, you're in a hateful mood. I don't want you around. Yes? Well, then would you go into crying at the loss of, of a member of family or someone close in death? It's those mm -hmm. tears that happen as a result of that. All right. Explore it. Explore it, each one for yourself. When someone dies, is that what you said? All right, uh, a parent dies, a child dies. You're going to have to do this very individually in order to really see. Find out why you cry. Find out. Find out the real reason. Did you have, did you have memory invested in that child, that parent, that husband, that wife? Did you have rich memories invested in that person? Also, 
right back where we started. When you cry, when you weep, look at yourself and ask yourself, why? Why did you go into weeping when you heard that this person died? Why? I'll tell you, I'll tell you that 99% of weeping over the death of someone is mechanical imitation. You cry because you're supposed to cry. That does not mean when you don't cry that you're hard-hearted and cold or indifferent or anything like that. It means you understand. It means you are not going to neurotically use the death of another person to get a false feeling of life. Well, she cried over, the, over his death. Look how much she cares. They fought like cats and dogs. <laughs> yes, Al? There's fear involved there. Fear. Yes. Yeah. Fear I'm not going to have the misery, not going to have the pleasure. Of the pleasure of fighting, maybe. Yeah. Besides, I'm next. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One, in, two. In essence, uh, then what I what I am really looking at when I question myself, why am I crying? Am I crying because of the loss of a human being or my loss? My loss, large man. There's also underlying very hateful bitterness against what I've called God for taking away from me. Big meat. Mm -hmm. It's underlying and very potent. Very have, have, yeah, good, Larry. Have any of you ever treated anyone very badly who later died? Yes. Huh? Yes. Been mean to them, ex-wife, ex-husband, any, and they died? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm getting at, don't yes. you? How about guilt? Mm -hmm. They're gone. I can't ever make it up to them, which you shouldn't have done anyway. You should have understood. Then you've made it up to yourself, and that's what counts. Yes. Well, Speedy, just trying to take me over this morning. Tell us about this it. Morning. And I always think of myself, Speedy, as nice, right, uh -huh. sweet. And I went the opposite. I'm not enjoying it. Okay, sure. And I started doing that. And you got me, you know, by, you know, by uh, not going along with it. You okay. Know, I don't suppose to let it, things like that. I don't, in other words, I don't suppose to break that. That's always been my condition. Sadness, in other words, I don't suppose to break that. And as I start calling this bluff, resentment start coming for doing that. Okay, know. okay. The greater your sense of loss, the m the greater your sense of loss, the more you're working on yourself. See, Juan, you may have actually felt a sense of loss over losing your self-pity, your self friendship right. right. You're going to feel empty when all these little demons, sub-devils go. You're going to feel empty because they've been keeping you company all these years, mm -hmm. and you enjoy having them around. There's someone to talk to. And they can talk to you, for example, tell you how persecuted you've been, right? You like to hear that, right? You're not going to hear that anymore. Goodbye, little sub-devil. Yes, one. Did you have your hand up? No, you said little sub-devil. It's about it. Oh. <laughs> Let's take a break. It is good and necessary to be in a class like this. It is good and necessary to read books, to hear tapes, to get all the help you can. Sooner or later, sooner or later, you're going to have to see that you are really on your own. You can't really, really borrow from anyone else. You can't borrow strength from anyone else. What you can do is get all the help you can to develop your own strength so that it comes from you, so that you're independent of me, of Rod, of Jim, of Rudy. You're independent of Jesus Christ. You're independent of labels, of names. 
The strength is yours. It's all yours, and it operates wherever you go. Get all the help you can, but see that you have to keep throwing the responsibility right here all the time, as often as you can, as heavy as you can. I've told you many times, overload yourself to where you begin to groan with all the self-work you've put on yourself. Read more. Walk consciously more. Interrupt yourself more. Anything you can do to pour the, the trouble on yourself, the burden on yourself. Again, that's the one thing that the devil doesn't want. He wants you to take it easy, to lean on someone else, to like other people to flatter you, to tell you that you're all right, which puts us in division because we know we're not, right? We know we're not all right. Oh. But the whole work burden on yourself until you begin to feel the protest. Until you feel the protest, you're not giving yourself enough work. You're just taking it easy. Rush recklessly into your own ego destruction. Rush recklessly into your own ego destruction. Not caring about anything but its destruction. So that indeed the strength that you are living from is not from the surface personality, not from the level of the intellect, but from the whole of you, which is not just the whole of you, but the whole, get this, but from the whole of the universe, which is not poetic, but a fact. So that your strength is the strength of the entire universe because you are one with it not apart from it, so that it's not your strength, it is the strength, which is your strength because you're part of the strength. A certain physical expression just now, while we're still alive, of the whole strength. Aren't you tired of being afraid? Aren't you tired of being afraid? then go deeper into your fear. Aren't you tired of searching around for the answers? Aren't you weary of it? Huh? Okay. Here we are learning to not just find the answer here, but to be the answer here. First you find the answer, then that goes, because that's division. I have found the answer. That's still egotism. You've got certain knowledge, that's fine. Then, as the intellectual level is understood and falls away so that you are not there anymore, then you are the answer itself. And there's no division in that. Then you live from pure intelligence and you know exactly what to do when your car gets a flat tire out in the desert. First thing you, you don't do is to go into a panic or uh, why did this happen to me, but you consciously get out of the car and say, on the mechanical level, this car needs a new tire, I will put one on. So you put it on, deliberately working slowly so as to give yourself a minor shock in doing that, instead of worrying about being late to where you have to be. And if you'd use your head, you would have started a half hour earlier anyway, taking into consideration the fact that mechanical accidents do happen. How beautiful to use the devil to destroy the devil. Anytime we're negative in any way at all, how's this for a figure of speech? Anytime we're negative in any way at all, we are embracing the devil lovingly. Which is self-treachery, isn't it? Isn't it? Self-betrayal. You 
want to live another life, you can live another life. But you have to see the, the, the kind of a life you are now living. And not just come here to the class and speak intellectually about these things, which most of you are doing, which all of you are doing. You speak so beautifully intellectually, and you know, and I know, and everyone else knows that we're not living it. We're here to live it, to be it. Again, that's not poetics, it's not metaphysics, it's not spiritual uh, rhetoric. It's a fact that I can live it, that you can live it. As we learn to die to everything that we've been up until this point in our life. Comments, questions, we have lots of time for discussion. I have a tendency, I guess, to have a reoccurring pattern of thinking that okay, if I work hard today, then everything will be all right tomorrow uh, in the outer world. But then the two, there is no relationship to that, is there? In other words, we, we're all kind of conditioned that we equate growth with material gain. Are you talking about material gain? I guess in the back of my mind, but I feel that, in other words, if I do all right today, work, so to, in quotes. Well, on the mechanical level, obviously, if you work today, you'll get a paycheck next week. Why do you even have to think about that? You understand that quite clearly. It is a part of your nature that understands the law of cause and effect on the intellectual level quite clearly. You do a certain thing, you will get a certain result from it. Why do you pay any attention to that at all? If you need bread, go out and work and get some money and buy bread, and that's the end of it. When you look at the dollar bill, that should uh, arouse a lesson in your mind simply. Uh, what, here's a piece of paper that represents a dollar bill. Uh, this represents society's way, society's false way, based on society's delusion that there's competition for the dollar, that money is important. Just look at a dollar bill sometime and see how many things it can cause you to remember about what you've learned here. Yes, Larry? Go further on that, please, sir, will you? What do you want to know? Uh, how I delude myself and idolize the dollar unseen, unseen to myself. Well, your identity is attached to the dollar. Okay. For one thing, we've been told since we were small children that if you have a lot of money, that that is better than having no money, see? Or you have to be successful for a lot of money and all that. You know, when you really understand these things, life becomes so, so completely simple <coughs> Trueness is simplicity. <coughs> you know why you have financial problems for one reason? Pro one reason, because this is a mad world. If you live in, a, in a, another country, we happen to be fortunate here on the everyday level. If you live in another country where uh, they're poverty-stricken and all that, you could still work on yourself. But look, the answer to every question about the falseness of society in relation to money, in relation to politics, in relation to everything. If you really want to understand this, be true. You be true yourself, and don't try to understand it on your own level, because you can't, because you will get yourself into it. The devil can't really understand the devil. Darkness can't understand darkness. Get outside of it, life will become very simple as far as money is concerned. There's no way I can explain it to you. There's no way, because it's not on the level of verbal explanation. I'm sitting here seeing it, knowing there's no way I can tell you this, but I can tell you that you can see it for yourself, so that this type of question won't come up. 
You're still identified with money, confused by it. I've told you many times, you need money to put bread and crumpets on the table. Tea and crumpets, wasn't it? Tea and crumpets on the table and forget it. Your life is not to get <coughs> twice as much tea and crumpets, just enough to keep the physical body alive. There's nothing the matter with have sa having savings. Having savings in the bank, for example, will, on, in its proper level, reduce your instinctive fear of not having bread tomorrow. It's, it's good to remember that you must have bread tomorrow. And you do that because man is mad. If man wasn't mad, then you could indeed forget all about it because all of society would be sane and everybody would have bread tomorrow. But it's not that way. You have 10,000 questions about life there is one answer that will answer every one of them, which is to be who you really are. Instead of being a confused human being who has confused ideas toward money, toward sex, toward marriage, toward employment. This is what it means to be in the world, but not of it right in the middle of that madhouse office, that fierce competition for getting a contract, for building a house or selling books or whatever, right in the middle of the fierceness of it and not being part of it. Those of us who are working in the selling the books of New Life books, we are working on ourselves to see what we're right in the middle of the, a business affair, selling books, doing... Uh, business with people, some nutty people, for example, using it to be sane in the midst of it. then the questions will all go away. See it for yourself. Be the answer yourself. You are the answer. Your real nature is the answer to every question you have. Then there's no question at all, because you see, you understand. You understand what it means to live sanely in an insane world. And it is 50 times more insane than you know. Start with that. Don't forget that. The world is 50 times more insane than you know it is because you haven't seen your own insanity yet to the depths to which you must see it. If you cry, you're insane. Work with that. Which is not a criticism, but a fact. And we're here to see facts. don't quote about Christ weeping. Never mind about Christ. You're here. You're here now. What about you? Are you afraid of God? Find out who God is. Who's this picture you have? What is this picture you have that you're afraid of? You can't be afraid of God. You can only be afraid of an idea you have about God. Your conditioned idea is that he'll send you to hell. Or he's looking down and watching you, catching you in that evil act.
and you think God is watching you, you're an egotist. Yes, Lillian. There's always got to be a fear of God because we were taught to pray. And in order to pray, there is a embedded fear that we will not receive what we prayed for, which means that we have a fear that God can withhold the things that we ask for. So therefore, there must be a realization that God does not give and God, God does not withhold before there can be freedom from fear. The whole business, yes. We humanize God, do we not? Yes. What we are, he is. Yeah, sure. He's a big, big bully at times. Sometimes he's nice to us, so we try to please him, appease him. Mm -hmm. Yes? So, so in essence, what it amounts to, man was not created in the image of God. God was created in the image of man. <laughs> That's true. <clears throat> right. We project, in other words. Right. Maybe a little silly, but a person could drive himself nuts trying to think that out, couldn't they? <laughs> sure, Maria. I mean that on a, yeah. other than yeah. We're here to get facts, to get right ideas, to experiment, to see, to admit. Yes. <clears throat> the, the inability to understand these clear, short maxims now. Is that a result of just a weak muscle, or is that also is that also a wall? Well, it's a distortion. Uh, give us a short, clear maxim. Can you think of one? If not, I will. Um, I can't think of one. Okay, there is a way out. There is a way out. Now, now look, now look, listen. I've given you a short, clear maxim. There is a way out. Now, is that a fact or not? Don't you say yes. You don't know whether it's a fact or not. I'm going to tell you that I know that it is a fact. I'm going to speak personally. I know that that's a fact. It's not a delusion with me. It's not imagination. I'm not trying to press you. I'm telling you that as a fact, there is a way out. Now, you tell me why you don't understand that. You don't, you understand. Don't say you do. You just, that's a hope maybe, you know, they'll hope nothing. Why don't you understand the, the fact, the maxim, that there is a way out? Obviously because you're not out. Start out. Take it as a fact, but as an idea, the idea is not an experience, is it? We're here to make the fact the personal experience, to make it me. Not an idea I have. If I take and have an idea I have, then I become a preacher. And I preach to others. I get, get on television and preach to millions. There is a way out, folks. I'm not even out myself. But I've imagined that I am. That gives me a good feeling, but I'm deluded and I'm a devil. And I'm the blind leading the blind into the ditch. What a shock I have to go through to see how I've lied all my life religiously, quoting to myself or to you. There is a way out, brethren. God loves you. Which is a fact, because there is a way out. Yes, Lou. You say a fact, there is a way out. Problem enters then when the mind takes over, as it must when it's asleep, and comes into all kinds of conclusions and ideas about that fact instead of just letting the fact be. There is a way out without anything else. Without getting an eye into it. Yes. The minute I get an eye into the statement, there is a way out, I get real, real hopeful. And But see, look. My idea of, of there is a way out. Ah, there's a way out of getting my wife to quit going to the divorce court and demanding 500 a week from me. 
Huh? We're not talking about that. You're digging the hole deeper. <laughs> what, Al? You're digging the hole deeper when you're talking that way. It's the conclusions that get us into trouble. Such people who interpret it that way don't come back to this class. The second <laughs> time. Yes. In other words, when you, when you say there is a way out, the natural thing through my conditioning is to say, tell me, show me, give me the method, the system to do it. Well, we are, we are, of course. We're just warning against identification with the phrase. Or sometimes I might even ask, don't tell me, prove it to me. Right. You know what our, one of our favorite illustrations for that is? I think I asked Mark the last time. Where's Mark? There's Mark. Mark, describe to me the taste of a peach. <laughs> <laughs> Try one. <laughs> Good. Good. Try it for yourself. See for yourself. Taste for yourself. That's your proof. Put yourself on the spot more. Would you? All right, now you have to work. I said to you, put yourself on the spot more. Somebody explain what that means according to the class. Yes? A simple way. When you have a food or a new food or anything, eat it without comparing it to something else and see how impossible it gets. If you eat uh, a new dish, you sit there. I've noticed the first thing the boys do is smell it always they smell it then they pick it up and they tentatively taste it and then they say this is like so and so and so and if the what they compare it with is something they like they eat it if it's something they don't like they won't eat it they can't just eat it for what it is all right don't compare is that what you're saying yes. okay you heard that boys <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, put yourself on the spot. More, more answers to that. How can you put yourself on the spot more? Put the pressure on yourself. One, two. When I'm thrown an object, instead of discarding it, when I get a right idea in this class, instead of just filing it mentally, don't accept it on my own intellectual knowledge of it look deeper into it that's a long way to well start. look deeper that's yeah. fine larry look deeper into the whole thing yeah search it out further pardon search it out further good yeah no. good that's fine stop apologizing for yourself apologetic spirit yes. you have an apologetic spirit don't you who has an apologetic spirit? I see some of you with apologetic expressions on your face right in this room. I see some of you, if I may personalize again, come up to me wondering what kind of a mood I'm in. <laughs> and if you think I'm in a bad mood, maybe you better give me a nice smile to calm me down. I'm exaggerating for the fun of it a little bit. Mine is similar to Dorothy. Stop appeasing. Stop appeasing, yes. Uh, keep questioning your motive. Question your motive. The, the real, what's the real motive, right? No. Don't you be afraid of that real motive when you see it. It's going to shock you when you see the real reason you do that. It'll probably be connected with sex or money. <laughs> One word. Stop. 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 Anywhere I can use it. Anywhere I go, go. Caution. <laughs> Zena will restore sense.
responsibleness to the class. Quit coming up with the answers. Quit coming up with the answers. No. <laughs> <laughs> Quit coming up with our, our conditioned answers which have done nothing for us. How's that for an improvement? <laughs> Dorothy? Risk rejection. Say that loud. Risk rejection. Risk rejection. How many of you want to be loved? <laughs> Do you ever stop to think that the other person finds it very difficult? <laughs> How about impossible? <laughs> You want per impossible to love? <laughs> what do you say about Al and I have been married 32 years today, and I swear I don't see how he did it. <laughs> well, I could add something, but I don't know. <laughs> I know what it would be. <laughs> Sir, sir, may I add something to You it? may. <laughs> At your own risk. Happy anniversary. <laughs> I'm yes. Putting yourself on the spot. I don't know. You will find out. No, to be able to say that and honestly mean it. Okay, okay. When I'm presented because the well, best thing for me is to have an answer. I'll, I'll tell you one way, one way. Put yourself on, to put yourself on the spot means in one way to no longer let imagination take you over so that you assume you are behaving rightly. You imagine, for example, in a conversation with another person that you must behave in a certain way, what? To please him, to impress him, to uh, answer the way you think he, he wants you to answer and all that. Put yourself on the spot by, first of all, seeing that you're putting on this phony mechanical conversation. And, and you really don't like to do that, but you're caught up in it, are you not? It's carrying you forward. Put yourself on the spot by seeing that you're kind of a phony saying that to that person, right? You're saying because it's expected of you and, and the, the, the new baby or the new house, you're expected to say certain things. You catch yourself right in the middle of your gushing over what you know they want you to gush over, their turnip garden, right? <laughs> don't gush over the turnip garden. Look at it and, and enjoy it, but don't gush over it. Put yourself on the spot by seeing how you're playing a role. That would be putting yourself on the spot. You can appreciate the turnip garden once you are conscious about it. Yes. Um, can I give an example? Please give an example. Right. At, um, at work last week, I didn't go to a meeting that I was supposed to have gone to. I mean, really, I was supposed to have gone to and I didn't go. The next day, my boss came in and said, did you go to that meeting last night? He knew I hadn't. <laughs> and I said no and I had thought the day before I'm going to hear about this but I'm not going to give an excuse and I gave an excuse All right. and then because he thought he had me he mentioned they're signing some petitions again for the same thing because so he mentioned that the petition was down in a lounge for those who wanted to sign it and he knows I didn't sign the last one and then he asked me to take a, a junior high school student assistant who never show up on time and they're more bothered than they're worth. <laughs> and nobody wants them. So he laid that on me to try to, uh, to, to say yes to that. But I, I could see all these going, I didn't take him, the junior high assistant. I, didn't say anything about the petition. There wasn't anything to discuss. But I could see, I forgot what the point was. <laughs> I got so involved in what I was talking about. Oh, that this man thought that he had me. You know, the violence behind the whole the Right, whole, right, right. The whole thing. And I could see my giving in, just putting myself on the spot when I made an excuse for not going to the meeting, even though on the practical level I should have gone. 
that, as far as I'm concerned, is one small way of putting oneself on the spot. All right. The time will come when you will see that you have to decide your own life. In situations like that, look, society, a mad society, will put pressure on you in hundreds of ways. As you begin to understand these things, you'll know how to handle them. And you'll even do certain things which you might at the beginning think are compromised, which are not compromised at all. We, we've said it many times. You, you, you say that your money is used to buy war machines to kill people. All right, you're not going to pay your taxes. We'll come see you on visiting days. <laughs> see? So you pay your taxes. But you do it understanding that you're not doing it. You're not doing it in a state of illusion. You know what you're doing. You're doing it quite consciously. Lillian will proceed. I think it was in one of your earlier books you told the difference between a sign that said, sorry, closed, and one that said, closed. And whenever we give an excuse, we have immediately given the other person the feeling that he is correct. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had to find an excuse. If we are correct, we just say no, and that's it. Yeah. Apologetic spirit. You know, when we first started this class, it's been about three years now, Joan, something like that. Was it been about three years? And we had three people. <laughs> That's right. Had three people. Um, and we'd give talks. I even gave a talk. That's <laughs> Some, some of the speakers, uh, the other two speakers, <laughs> especially Sally, <laughs> used to say, thank you and sit down. Don't thank people for listening to you talk. No apologetic spirits. They'll pounce on that. You, you they never thank your audience for anything when you give a talk. Instead say, you idiots, why didn't you pay attention? <laughs> You understand I'm saying that. They really, they, they think that they are giving you something that you, by being out in the audience. Wonderful me is sitting here giving you someone to talk to. You, you think I'm exaggerating? I remember a statement you made, a, 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 a comment you made. That the only thing we had to bring to class was our second. I defied it then when you spoke it, but I see now. The only thing I've got to bear or show here is my frailties, my shortcomings, and then for me to see through that. Okay, Sally. We are actually telling other people how to treat us. When I say thank you, I'm saying you have done something for me. Yeah. And they'll have contempt. It's like the man who was trying to make Dorothy feel guilty. He thought he had her. Did he? No. No, she didn't fall. Oh, could I yeah. have one? A more interesting part of that story is that there was another teacher didn't go either. And this is a man, and he's big and brawny and works out. The boss didn't have the courage to confront him face to face. This is true. He put a tight notice in, in his mailbox. Well, take muscle training and you'll do the same thing. <laughs> Look, I want to tell you something serious. You listen to this. Try to understand. I'm struggling to put it in the right way. Try to understand. When you really know, when you see, when you are, that you have God, truth, reality, with a capital R, call it what you, truth, capital T, on your side, when is, is on your side, are you going to fawn or apologize to anyone for anything? You can't bribe me with a million dollars, you'll say to the world. Cast thyself down and I'll give you the world, the devil told Christ. He said, nothing doing. You have nothing to give me. I have God, universe, capital U on my side. When you see this, 
When you live this, when you are this, can you be bribed? Can you be even tempted? Are you going to fawn before anyone? Are you going to let them take any of this bit of seed of truth that you have away from you? You start, don't you let anyone take this small seed of truth that you have. Don't you let anyone try to destroy it. Don't you let the rocks pile on top of it from an insane society. Insane people want you to remain insane so they'll have someone to talk to. They don't want to talk to a sane human being. Do you think your own wife or husband or child or parent wants you to become sane? They fear you becoming sane. They hate you becoming sane because they love their insanity. Hang on to this bit you have now. It'll grow stronger every day. Then you see if there's any, any problem at all with anyone else. You can't be bribed by anything. not by the entire world. You will, you will, you will not, no longer choose truth over the, the gift of the entire world and all its women and all its money. You, you won't choose it because there's no choice anymore. You are the world itself. You're the whole thing. So what's there to choose? So even temptation, no temptation. You can't give me a thing, nothing. Too late, you could have 10 years ago. Now we're smart. You're wasting your time. You're telling the world, trying to bribe me anymore. I've seen through it. You had me for all these years, right? I was dumb. I was a sucker. I was gullible. No more. Too late. I finally got smart. It took me all this time, but I finally got too late. yourself in the spot, going against your habitual responses. For instance, if you usually explain your life to others, stop explaining. Mm -hmm. I will now find Sally. Thank you. I'll put you on the spot. From now on, when you give a point, Force yourself to think of an example to make it clearer to us as Sally just did. For example, for instance, something personal, something you've read in a book could be all right. Any kind of example to make it clearer. It's much easier for you when you ask a question just to throw something out and let someone else answer it. You work harder on the questions you ask by giving an example to make your question clearer to us. You've seen in this class how difficult it is to understand some of the comments that are made. Have you not? You take the responsibility from now on, and let's see if you do, because it won't be mentioned again probably, putting yourself on the spot to work harder when you ask a question to make a comment to give us an illustration, an example, to make it clearer to us. And even if you even if you say, for instance, and then have to sit there and think for five minutes, that's acceptable because you're trying. You put strain on yourself. That's good. May I try what you just sure. said? Sure. Okay. Uh, last week, wait a minute. Put myself on the spot. Stop talking right in the middle of the conversation. When I see that I'm just laughing to another person. Okay. Last week, I said. Amongst a group of people, I wanted something from them. I, I wanted something from them. Okay. I was asked a simple question by one man who didn't even hear himself ask it. Where are you from, sir? I could have said, where, where did you come from? Something like where you were born. I don't even remember what it was for sure. I could have said Des Moines, New Mexico, and shut up. I didn't. I trailed on a ways, and I saw... Nobody was listening. They were looking, 
And I saw I was, is this what we call talking in our sleep? And I just stopped. Mm -hmm. Then I felt my own tension because people expected me. Okay. Okay. And I just stopped, period. That's a good point, one particular point there. We're, we're afraid of disappointing others, afraid of them looking at us. Maybe we're, we're working on ourselves and saying, hey, you never did that before. Understand? They expect us to behave a certain way. Even if you don't get mad like you used to, they're going to be very much shocked. You used to blow up. Oh, you're just suppressing it. Maybe you are. But you're working. Yes. I uh, last night my son brought the radio in so I could listen to a program. And it's a silly program, but I like to listen to it. And someone else came in, doesn't like the program, but took the radio out without asking me. Took the radio out and then went out and watched television. And I sat there and I just I resented it, but I didn't know, you know, whether I should get angry and say anything, whether I should calmly say something, or whether I should just watch my resentment before. Yeah, I'll start with watching your resentment. You know, because we're all dumb and asleep and fearful and want things from other people, we get ourselves in a certain involvement with other people, whether in the family or in business or socially or whatever. We get ourselves involved. All right. This connects with what you said. Having got ourselves involved because we're dumb and weak and scared with other people, they're giving us comfort and company and all that. Having got ourselves into the mess, we now have to begin to work ourselves out of it. Not by walking away necessarily physically from a real human relationship you have, but studying it so that if you do walk out, you first walk out mentally, then perhaps, and this has to be very individual, I, I couldn't begin to give you advice, I never would, then you would walk out physically from that relationship if you see, really see, that it is wrong. So when you're involved with another human being in a conflict like that, Obviously, put the attention where it belongs, watching yourself here. For one thing, you'll see how you are indeed intimidated by other people, afraid of arousing their anger. Don't deliberately arouse their anger. That's not part of your work. Your work is to see how you are behaving so that you're free of that person. You're free When you're totally free of that person, it's because you're free of yourself. Then you'll know what to do on the everyday level, yes. Exactly how I'm reacting, then I'll be free of it. If you see it, but it won't come tomorrow. <laughs> <clears throat> but it's all right not to blow up. Yes. Well, not to blow up, but I almost felt like you know I had. I'm practically speaking. I had the right to listen to my radio program. And I thought, you know, is that because I'm just intimidated and not doing anything about it, or is it because I'm watching my Listen to what Lillian no, says. No, I was just going to say, go into your dissertation on, I have the right to. I have the right to live my own life the way I wish, naturally, as long as it's based in self-wholeness, not in neurotic demands, not in trading with you. If I want to be alone, I'm going to, I'm going to... Uh, fix my life up is socially so that I'm alone what I want to be. If I want to be with you, I will be with you. It will be on a natural choice, to use that term. It'll be on a natural choice, not on a compulsion. Not from what society says is cooperation with you. Yes. Well, uh, I noticed too that people will think they can <coughs> Uh, run things for you, you know, much better than yourself. And so, uh, my, I catch myself uh, always saying something back, which I shouldn't do, but I want to say, well, who are you telling me what to do? I want to get uh, this out of the question, too. Look, now, don't raise your hand to this, please. Raise it internally. Now, I want to ask you a question. You answer it silently. Don't raise your hand. 
do you at least dimly suspect that maybe, maybe, you are in a wrong human relationship? Suspect with anyone. A, a, you're involved in a wrong human relationship. Start with that. You'll find out that you got involved because there's something wrong with you and with the other person that you got involved with. All right. So we walked into it in our sleep. We can walk out of it with our consciousness. It's as simple as that and as hard work as that. Don't you blow up anything in your home. You work on yourself in your home. Vernon, uh, some time ago, before I came to the meetings or started this classes, I suddenly came to the conclusion, and I'm asking, is this a fact? I thought, I come into this world alone, and really I live alone, cause it's, <clears throat> and I go out alone. Of course you do. Of course you do. While having human relationships, of course you do. You know, uh, uh, I'll go ahead. Yeah, I'm just thinking of this girl with the situation because it is so parallel to many things that I face in, in everyday relationships. Yes. Someone's doing something exactly the same thing. And the, the question is coming to my mind as I have to face it myself is why didn't I just go get my radio? Yeah. Why do I have to well. explain it, justify it, or anything? Live from who you really are and you'll know what to do. You may get the radio or you may forget it or you may not even be in the situation where you have to make a decision. Yes. I will even fight you while you're trying to take away my vanity in this class. I will even fight you while you are trying to take away my ego and destroy my ego. Yeah, what you're really fighting is for the preservation of your own yes. conditioned yes. self. Yes. Right. I have noticed this in, in my relationship with other people, all other people, which is like I get to know them or I allow them to know me up to a certain point. But after that point, I back away. It's, sure. It's as if, but sure. possibly though for the wrong reason. It's like if you knew what I was really like. You would want to have anything to do with me. <laughs> you were. You had to You said it. <laughs> Sir, what makes you think he doesn't and you're still here? Larry, you were in conflict then, weren't you? Uh... Yes. That was a wise acre remark. Okay. We'll take another five minutes, though. <laughs> Try leaving it there for now. I'll give you a little shock. morning. See you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. First, let me ask, are there any secret grouches in the room? May I see the hands of the secret grouches, please? May I see the hands of the open grouches, please? May I see those who are both open and secret grouchy? 
Now that we understand each other, we can start. You're a grouch because you're self-centered, you're egotistical, the world revolves around you and your petty little affairs. That's why you're a grouch. Don't you know, don't you understand that being authentically cheerful, not falsely so to get something from someone or impress someone or to put on an act, don't you understand that simply being cheerful all the time, seriously cheerful, sometimes light-heartedly cheerful, but always cheerful, is a part of your natural reward for doing your work on yourself, which you're not doing much of, which is why you're still grouchy, which is why you can still be, you can still be turned, turned into grouchiness by the slightest incident, by a disappointment, by your business dropping in volume, by seeing how old you're growing, you turn fearful and grouchy. See how grouchiness and fear go together? Real cheerfulness is an integrated part of your wholeness. It can smile, it can be quite sober, but it's simply a part of your being in command of yourself. You know, the whole, the whole reason for us being here in this room can be simplified astonishingly as follows. Am I taking these lessons these feelings, these emotions, these shocks. Am I taking these with me? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, etc. Using them every day and in every way I possibly can. Am I using these lessons during the day to do one essential thing. Let's simplify it. Always simplify it in your mind. Be logical, be simple, be direct to the point, and remember what your point is. Am I remembering what I've learned here all day long to simply increase the light and decrease the darkness? Which is one reason I wanted to find out if you were grouchy don't you understand that grouchy is a part of your grouchiness is a part of your psychic sleep, of your darkness, of your being so totally self-concerned, of taking yourself seriously because you think you exist as this person who must succeed, who must be treated nicely, who must live a, a dream life without being found out. You ask yourself, those of you who have been coming here for a long time, how many today, today is Friday, how many separate individual things did each one of you, I'm talking individually now, did you do today increase your darkness, never mind the mad world, how many separate things did you do today to decrease your darkness and in thereby increase the light? Did you catch yourself right in the middle of that conversation with someone and see that you were getting a feeling of, of what? A feeling of superiority or a feeling that, ha, now I'll get you. A feeling that being with this person that you were being taken care of that you were secure in the presence of that person? Could you have noticed this and then, and then dared to risk the loss of your pseudo-security of being with someone that you could ask a question of or just to be with? Let's pursue that for a minute. Let's 
been some time since we've discussed the value, the gold of winning through losing. What inside of you is resisting a loss because it's familiar to you, because it's mechanical, because it's it's comfortable with you all day long and you will not risk you won't even risk seeing seeing the fear that you would have if you risked the loss of it take a daydream how many of you were in a daydream any time today everybody raise your hand don't you know that you could have decreased your fear of life of which you're loaded by risking the loss of that daydream of that imaginary picture that mental movie that ran through your mind whatever kind it was because it wasn't practical it could have been that is you could have had practical imagination in your mind but you didn't 